everyone welcome to this last week week five of the first hundred years so we have a, a triple threat today happiest polycarp and Irenaeus. uh they're writing some of them the first two are writing about 130 140 a.d Irenaeus is writing about 180 and the way that they're connected why we're doing them all together is they all knew each other and so you had the apostle john who toward the end of his life was in Ephesus, which is in turkey and he, two of his disciples were two of these figures, Polycarp and Papias, they would have known each other. And then a disciple of Polycarp was Irenaeus. So you see here, there's only one person in between Irenaeus writing in 180 and the apostle John. And that's partly because John lived a long time and then Polycarp lived a long time. And uh, that's where Irenaeus met him. So these three figures are this week uh, because they, they were all kind of connected. Now, one of them we already heard about, uh, Polycarp. Polycarp was one of the letters that St. Ignatius of Antioch wrote. You remember he was going through Turkey, being taken to his um, execution in Rome. And on the way, he wrote these seven letters. One of them was a personal letter to Polycarp. And so um, we've already encountered one of them. Okay, so uh, we're going to start here. If you look here, um, now you have your, your handout. You can pause this and print it off if you need it. But that goes along on the website with this, with this, um, with this session. So you see here on page one. Uh, we have first just a little, a little snippet from Irenaeus's writings uh, describing how um, he knew Papias, the hero of John, and a companion of Polycarp, uh, and that there's actually five books written by Papias. So um, you hear a little bit about him there. And then the second writing that we have on the first page is a little snippet from someone we're going to see a little bit more of in a minute. Uh, Eusebius. Eusebius was the first church historian. He's writing in about 330 AD. Uh, and here, and what's interesting about his writings is sometimes he'll have um, direct quotes from other writings. So he'll, he'll write his history, but he'll intersperse it with direct quotes from writings, some of which we have, but some of those writings are now lost. And so uh, he's an interesting resource because sometimes he has preserved certain writings that we don't have the rest of them. So anyways, this is one example here. So we have um, Eusebius quoting Irenaeus. And here we have Irenaeus writing to an old friend of his from the past, Florinus. And this is an, a neat little writing because you, you hear um, Irenaeus kind of share personally, um, the impact that Polycarp had on him. So you see here, um, maybe about 10 lines down. For while I was still a boy, I knew you, Florinius, in Lower Asia, in Polycarp's house, when you were a man of rank in the royal hall and endeavoring to stand well with him. I remember the events of those days more clearly than those which happened recently, for what we learn as children grows up with the soul and he's united with it. So he's describing saying, you know, Flernus, remember when we were young and remember when we used to gather in Polycarp's house and he used to pass on the faith to us. And then he gets, he has um, kind of this vivid presentation of his memory here. So that I can speak even to the place where blessed Polycarp used to sit and where he used to have conversations, how he came in and how he went out, the character of his life, the appearance of his body. Uh, the discourses that he made to people, how he reported his speaking with John and with the others who have seen the Lord. So here's Irenaeus later in life, recalling back, talking to Flarinus, say, remember Polycarp, remember, I can, and I can still remember everything about him, you know, just the impression he made on me, even though his manner of speaking and the way he would walk and all of that, you know, these are very vivid memories to me. So it's kind of a neat, um, a neat little snippet here. So, We'll flip that page over and come back to it in a little bit. So the first one of these three we'll look at briefly is Papias. So Papias lived about 70 to 163, and most of what we have from him is preserved in that writing I just was referring to from Eusebius. Um, not a whole lot, even though he wrote five books, those books were all lost. So we just have little quotes from Eusebius. Um, now, oops. so one of these writings we're gonna see here, and so if you go to page two, um, we hear Papia saying, and the way to think about this first paragraph is something that I would have been told as a child. You know, make sure you 
talk to your great grandparents and your grandparents because they were the greatest generation. You know, those memories of the Second World War and uh, the Depression and all of this, you know, the, the life that they went through was just incredible. And it's you want to hear that from them while they're still alive. Yeah, you can always read it in history books later, but this is a, a, a golden opportunity to really for, hear firsthand from that previous generation. That's what Papias is doing. So he's an early Christian writing at a time when everyone but John had passed away by this point. But some of the first disciples of the apostles are still there. So those who um, knew Andrew and Peter and John personally are still walking the earth. And so this is what Papias is doing and what he's going to say here we're going to see is he had a great passion for talking to them directly because he knew that that generation was going to pass away. So let's see here. Halfway through that first paragraph. If then anyone who attended on the elders or the apostles came, I asked minutely after their sayings what Andrew or Peter said or what was said by Philip or by Thomas or James, John or Matthew or any of the other of the Lord's disciples, which things Aristian and the Presbyter John, the disciples of the Lord say. For I imagined that what was to be got from books was not so profitable to me as what came from the living and abiding voice. So it's simply happy of saying, you know, a lot of what I've learned has come directly from those who knew the apostles personally. Now, the second paragraph is really interesting from a, um, a biblical point of view because it gives us insight into how the Gospels were written. Uh, and so here, and it's the same thing he just said, that, you know, he would go around and, and talk to those disciples of the apostles, one of whom was Mark. So here, Mark, in his capacity as Peter's interpreter, so we have a, that's how, that's the connection between Mark, who wrote the Gospel of Mark, and Peter, that Mark was someone who went around with Peter interpreting for him. Peter was a Jewish man. He probably knew a little bit of Greek, but not necessarily was he fluent in it. And so Mark was someone who would go along with Peter as Peter would go around to these different areas and he would help Peter to interpret. Okay. So Mark wrote down accurately as many things as he recalled from memory, although not in an ordered form of the things either said or done by the Lord. Okay. So what we're reading between the lines, what's going on is after Peter had died, Mark kind of seeing what was going on, like, oh my gosh, like that first generation is passing away. Let's get this in writing. I heard Peter preach day in and day out. I knew what he, all these sh stories about Jesus that he shared with everybody. Someone has to get this down in writing. I'm going to do it. So this is Papias describing how the Gospel of Mark came about. That Mark decided just to capture from memory what he remembered Peter saying, get it down in writing. You notice he says there, though not in an ordered form, Sometimes people pull their hair out like, oh my gosh, you have Luke's gospel, Matthew's gospel, and Mark's gospel, and they're not in the same order. What is that about? What is Okay, what Papias is saying is, even in his time, he's pointing out that, no, no, Mark, his intention wasn't to get it down in the exact order that Jesus said these things. His point was, let's just capture these stories, these little snippets, these little stories. So what he calls these is carrie, these little paragraphs. Um, of stories about Jesus's life. So here we have, for neither he, for he neither heard the Lord nor accompanied him. That's Mark. So Mark didn't know Jesus personally, but he heard Peter, Peter share. But later, as I said, Peter, who used to give his teaching in the forums as carry I short sayings, but had no intention of providing an ordered arrangement of the words of the Lord. Consequently, Mark did nothing wrong when he wrote down some individual items just as he related from memory. So he would just go, OK, this came to mind, that came to mind. I'm just going to write them down as they come to my mind. And then he goes on that Matthew's gospel, though, put it in a more ordered arrangement. So in a way that was a little easier for people to remember and to see the arguments and those kind of things. So um, it's an interesting insight into how the gospels came about, that that second generation, when the apostles are passing away, those who knew the apostles and had heard them preach day in and day out were the ones, like Mark here, who just wrote them down, captured everything they could. Okay, so that's Papias. Now Polycarp. Polycarp is uh, very interesting because we know so much about him. So you see here, you know, he lived about 65 to 155 AD. He was a direct disciple of John, as we already heard from Irenaeus, but he has so much either written by him or about him. 
So he wrote one work. We're going to see one paragraph in the, his letter to the Philippians. We have a very early account of his martyrdom, written probably within a few years of his martyrdom. Some of the eyewitnesses wrote down what happened. So very, very early writing about him. We have what we just saw, Irenaeus writing about his own memory about him when he was a young man. And then we already saw um, that St. Ignatius wrote to him and to his communi community at Smyrna. So we also have a letter written to him. So we have something written by him, something written to him, a couple things written about him by people who knew him personally. So we actually know a lot about Polycarp, a lot of really, really reliable information. So here, I think this is neat because it's something that uh, Polycarp would have carried with him. So this is the letter from St. Ignatius to Polycarp. St. Ignatius, if you remember from a few weeks ago, St. Ignatius is the Bishop of Antioch who's being taken across Turkey to be executed in Rome. And as he goes along, he's writing these letters. And Polycarp, who's a young bishop, is being is given this great gift, this, this personal letter from this giant of the faith. And Polycarp himself ends up giving his life for Jesus. And so you can just kind of get your, you know, think about that, that this, the very thing that Polycarp saw Ignatius do, that would have really edified him and strengthened him to do the same. So here we have these words from Ignatius that Polycarp would have held close his whole life. Having obtained good proof that your mind is fixed in God as, an upon, as upon an immovable rock, I loudly glorify his name that I have been thought worthy to behold your blameless face, which I may ever enjoy in God. So here's Ignatius, who everyone looks up to him, right? He's there in awe of what he's doing, giving his life. And yet he's writing Polycarp saying, you have so edified me that I consider it one of the greatest blessings that I have been honored to see you and that one day I hope to enjoy that forever for all eternity with you in heaven, right? So I'm about to be martyred, but I know one day you will be joining me um, in that eternal kingdom. So this is something that I mean, must have really built up Polycarp. Okay. So, um, Like I said, eventually Polycarp comes to his own martyrdom. So before we get there, there on page two, uh, let's look at one thing that Polycarp wrote, just one paragraph for Philippians, and this is going to be uh, helpful to us to understand, just as we just saw how the Gospels were composed, how did these letters, how are they preserved? And so you, there you see, you can read on your own, but um, here it's Polycarp writing to the Philippians saying, um, you know, you've written to me asking to share the letters that Ignatius gave to us. And so here you go, I'm responding back, attached to the letter I'm responding with, this letter, I'm going to attach these other letters to Ignatius. And then he asks the Philippians, if you have any writings of Ignatius or any other writings, send them back to us. So this shows that in the early church, they would share these letters. They would make a copy and then send it on to the next city. And then they would request back, hey, do you have anything? The New Testament letters would have been shared in the same way. Uh, so that's just a neat little thing from Polycarp here. Now at the bottom of two. Now we're we're into the the account of his martyrdom. So this is going to describe um, his death. One thing to listen for here is that the author goes out of their way to highlight the parallels between what Polycarp did and what Jesus did. That Polycarp is the is a disciple who is giving his life just as Jesus gave his life, but that he's going to draw these parallels here. So. I point them out as we go along. The other thing that's going to happen is there's going to be some, there's a lot of irony here or a lot of kind of um, just a little bit of dark humor in the story here. So let's see this. His pursuers then, along with the horsemen and taking the youth with them, went forth at supper time on the day of the preparation with their usual weapons. So already Jesus preparing for the Last Supper um, on the day of of Passover, the night before Passover. And they went out against him as against a robber. For having come about evening to the place where he was, they found him lying down in the upper room of a certain little house. So again, the last supper in the upper room. And from which he might have escaped to another place. But he refused, saying, the will of God be done. Okay, so remember, again, Jesus um, saying, you know, Father, um, not my will, but your will be done. And so Polycarp is echoing this. So when he heard that they had come, he went down and spoke with them. And as those that were present marveled at his age and constancy, some of them said, 
was so much effort made to capture such a venerable man? You know, so even his captors, these soldiers come out in their, you know, armor and all this, and they see this old 86 year old man. They're like, what are we doing? <laughs> like, is this really, is this really the people we're going after now? So going on immediately then in that very hour, he ordered that something to eat and drink should be set before them. So those who came to capture him, he first says, okay, well, let me feed you. Let me give you something to drink, bring out the wine, but I'm going to host you. I'm going to be hospitable to you, even though you've come to take me away to my death. What this allows him to do, though, is to spend some time in prayer, just as Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane on the day before he died. And so he goes, he goes and he prays. And then in the next paragraph, you see who he's praying for, all the people throughout the world that he's ever known and the whole Catholic Church. Um, so if you think about at Mass, right, we had the consecration, but before and after that, we pray for the church throughout the world. And we often pray for those who have gone before us. We could pray for uh pope francis and we pray for those who seek the lord and so on and so forth we there at the the offering of jesus we we pray for the church and we pray for all the individuals we know and we call them to mind uh, we see polycarp doing that uh there before he's about to offer himself up he spends that sacred time that that sacred uh, moment of offering himself to the father um he's praying also for all those he's ever known and then you go on there, even highlights that they brought him forth um, and they set him on an ass as they, as they conducted him into the city, just as Jesus did. OK, all right. So let's go to the next page here. Page three, second column. Here we have later. So this is after Polycarp has been martyred, after he's given his life. Uh, we have um, a, a piece here that is something we still do today. So you see that the Christians, after Polycarp's body had been burned in the fire, they went and afterwards we took up his bones as being more precious than the most exquisite jewels and more purified than gold. And we put them in a fitting place where being gathered together as opportunities allowed us with joy and rejoicing, the Lord shall grant us to celebrate the anniversary of his martyrdom, both in memory of those who have already finished their course and for the exercising and preparation of those yet to walk in their steps. There's two interesting things that you see there tied together that we do as Catholics today. One is they took care to, to, to gather up his bones. They preserve his relics. And so the fact that we have relics, you know, every, every altar um, in every Catholic church has a little piece of bone in it, a little relic from a saint, typically from a martyr who has gone before us. But then you see also when they would bring it out on the anniversary of his death, as we do today, we celebrate the we have feast days. We have the anniversary of the saints that we observe every year. Um, and so uh, we see already in this time that, you know, on the day that that he that he um, entered into eternal life was the day that they would then celebrate the anniversary of his death each year, both um, to celebrate him, to give glory to him, to God for what he did through him, but also to build us up as an example. So it's just a neat thing that that's exactly what we do today. Every, you know, all the saints, we have a feast day that we celebrate once a year and you see them doing this in, um, you know, 165 AD. So now we're into Irenaeus. All right, so Irenaeus, we're stopping with him because at this point, there's just so many writings, right? You have Irenaeus, 20 years after him, you have Tertullian, who's a giant. You have Cyprian, 20 years after him, uh, where you read their writings and it's like, okay, like this is the Catholic Church. There's no doubt about it. You know, um, everything we've read up till now, it's all there, but we have, we've been having to pry it open a little bit, right? At this point, you can pick up the writings of Cyprian on the um, unity of the church and it's like, okay, like this is what we believe. It's similar to Irenaeus. Irenaeus wrote a lot. Um, and some of the things that we see here, we're going to see just the clarity of their teaching here in 180 AD. If we had started with 180 AD instead of 85, this might be shocking to you. Like, oh my gosh, like, look how clear this is. But since we've been seeing it being pretty clear for a while, maybe it's not as impressive as if we started with 180 AD. But this is quite remarkable stuff that we're going to see. Okay, so um, St. Irenaeus, he was born in Turkey as we as he witnessed already, we, we read a little bit from him um, saying that he knew Polycarp and Papias and John, or he didn't know John, but he knew Polycarp. And so 
Um, we know that he came from Turkey, but he ends up being the Bishop of Lyon in France. And so he's kind of this bridge figure. He, he grew up in the East, but he was a Bishop in the West. Okay. Two of his most famous writings. One is this on the apostolic preaching. It's about 100 pages. Um, it's more or less just a summary of the Old Testament and then a filling out the Nicene Creed. So it's just the Nicene Creed in more detail. Uh, so again, you, you would pick this up and it's like, OK, this is this is what we believe. Yep, yep, yep. Sounds familiar, sounds familiar. Um, it's it's in a very succinct form. His other work, his more famous work, is an absolute beast. It's called Against Heresies. It's like 600 pages long. And what this is, we've seen a little bit of this already. So if you remember back to Ignatius, and one of the things he was arguing against was Gnosticism. These people who believed that the material world was bad, therefore God couldn't become man, because that would mean that the spiritual, which is perfect, became physical, which is evil. Okay. Over time, this idea kind of grew and became more complex. And one additional factor that started to get mixed in is some of these um, docetists, some of these heretics began to also say that the Old Testament was bad and the New Testament was good, which is not what we believe at all. We believe it's all in the same story. But their idea was, well, if we hear about God creating the universe in the Old Testament, God the Father, whatever they called him, God the Father must have been a bad God because he created the physical world, which is bad. But the God of the New Testament, Jesus, the word, um, he's the good God. You know, so it's just this crazy idea. Um, it's and what it ends up coming down to is it, it's new age. It's it's this um, idea that uh, the material world is bad. Spiritual world is good. Uh, Old Testament bad, New Testament good. And then it's mixed in with all these what we would now call new age kind of ideas, just this really complicated, like just circular argumentation, just really nutty stuff. Um, but that's that's what it is. And that's what Irenaeus is writing again against. So this we're not going to read this, but this is the type of nonsense he's dealing with. I mean, it's it just sounds it's just this fantastic, like just sounds like Star Trekky, like, you know how you have this Aeon who is also the Proarchy and the Propater and Bithus. And then you have Enoa and Sige and Caris, and then you have a Pythagorean Tetrad, and then Zoe and Anthropos and Ecclesia, Nous, Logos, Bithus, Mono, Monogenes, Aletheia. It's all of these like, it's just weird, like this kind of light and darkness material world, spiritual, good and evil. It's very dualistic is what it comes down to. And um, it's all a fantasy world. Um, these people probably just were bored and had nothing better to do, but um, Irenaeus had to write against them. So that's the, the source of what he's reading here. So we'll come back to this here. So Irenaeus here. So bottom page three. So his the first thing he's going to do is what we've already seen um, Ignatius especially do, um, but Clement also. Um, so paragraph one, the argument there you can read on your own, but his argument here is, OK, look, we know that the apostles knew Jesus personally, and then they raised up disciples after them. They then taught the next generation of Christians how to follow the Christian faith and appointed bishops in their place. OK, so we've already seen that in Clement and in Ignatius. Now. Irenaeus is going to say here that let's think this through because all this crazy theology that you hear, see here. They didn't believe in any of this and all the bishops don't believe in any of this. Why would. Their thought was the, the heretics who believe this was that this was a secret knowledge, and that's where the word Gnostic comes from. Valentinian, a Gnostic writer, it means knowledge. It was secret knowledge that was only passed down to elite Christians. So Ignat Irenaeus here is saying, who is more elite than the apostles? Who is more elite than their closest collaborators? And yet none of them know anything about this nonsense. 
So I don't know where these ideas are coming from, but it's clearly not coming from the apostles and therefore it's clearly not coming from Jesus. So that's what he's talked about in paragraph one. So if you flip to page four here, that begs the question, okay, well, who should we listen to then? And so here in paragraph two, Irenaeus says, look, just look to the bishops in whatever city that you're in. And he says, you can even trace back the succession of bishops in every city. So you can go to Alexandria and see, okay, who was the first bishop, second, third, fourth, fifth, to this present day. That's all you have to do. You don't need to go and to meet in secret rooms to get secret knowledge from these people who are just bored and just are in love with their own knowledge. Like, this is nonsense. This isn't the way Jesus wanted it. Um, that's too, Jesus didn't come to say the elites. I mean, if, if you read the Gospels and get that impression, I don't know, you, you've missed something, right? I mean, Jesus came for everybody, you know, average Joe, people of goodwill, peace to people of goodwill, not for people who spend time navel gazing, sitting in their rooms because they have all this extra time in their life, right? That's not the point of the Gospels. So looking at here, he's saying, look, we could go to any of these cities and trace back, but that would be tedious to line them all up. So let's look at one church and what one church, what one city are we going to choose? He says Rome. And why Rome? Because in that tradition derived from the apostles, the very great, the very ancient, the universally known church founded and organized at Rome by the two glorious apostles as a faith preached to men, which comes down to our times by means of the successions of the bishops. Here's a huge line right here now. For it is a matter of necessity that every church should agree with this church on account of its preeminent authority. That is a faithful everywhere in so much as the tradition has been preserved continuously by those who exist everywhere. This is an incredibly clear statement about how Irenaeus understood the church in Rome, the Roman Catholic Church. Irenaeus, remember, he came from Turkey and he's the bishop in France. He doesn't have a connection to Rome, but he's acknowledging as a third party that the Roman church is unique. That what we've already seen kind of hinted at in Clement, remember Clement, he's writing um, his letter with a certain um, kind of a directiveness is the word I was using. Like he's being directive in a way you wouldn't necessarily expect unless there was a more authority behind his position as the Bishop of Rome. Ignatius, when he writes to Rome, there's a certain deference he has toward the church there that maybe you wouldn't quite expect. But here, we don't have to read between the lines anymore. This is Irenaeus saying that the church in Rome, that it is necessary that all the other churches, all the other cities in the world agree with the church in Rome on account of its preeminent authority. We know that Peter was given that preeminent authority among the apostles, but it might be an open question. Was that then handed on to his successors? So we know that Peter, as a first bishop of Rome, had a preeminent authority. Jesus gave him and shared things with him and gave him um, authority that he didn't give to the other apostles. That's crystal clear in the New Testament. But the question is, was that then passed down? Was that preeminent authority passed down to his successors? Here, Irenaeus, says yes, that it is that authority was given so that the Church of Rome is the one that all it's the source of union between all the other churches in the world. So it's kind of a neat thing. I mean, it's it's so clear. There's no question about it, what he means here. Okay, And then paragraph three, we've already seen this when we covered um, Clement. It's uh, Irenaeus going through the list of the first popes. Um, you see, he kind of goes out of his way to emphasize that, um, you know, Clement, when he wrote his letter, talks about God being the creator and maker of all things. Now, Irenaeus is making sure that people understand, like, okay, like, we have a good God. The, the God who created and made all things, Clement, who wrote many, many years before us, understood that to be a good thing, that the God of the Old Testament is a good God. All right, flip the page, paragraph four here. Here you have, just as like we saw Irenaeus quoted before, sharing about Polycarp. Here we have him sharing a bit more um, how Irenaeus remembered when, you know, in his own early youth, 
Um, he remembers Polycarp um, when he was a very old man suffering martyrdom. Um, and then going on from there about three quarters of the way down. Um, you know, just witnessing to how with these Gnostics, with these heretics, that Polycarp himself faced a little bit of this. And when he came into contact with Marcion, who had these beliefs about the Old Testament being bad, um, Polycarp called him the firstborn of Satan. So it's Irenaeus saying, look, this isn't this isn't a game. Like Polycarp took this seriously. This isn't my opinion, and that's your opinion. We're all gonna be okay. It's like, no, like this stuff matters. Like we saw with Ignatius. If you get the theology wrong, you end up in trouble. If you don't believe that God is true God, if you don't believe that Jesus is true God and true man, um, it's gonna impact your spirituality. You're gonna deny the Eucharist being the flesh of Jesus. You're gonna deny that the the fleshy needs of people, the the physical needs of people should be met with charity. You're not gonna believe in the importance of meeting together because you don't believe that physicality matters, right? That was Ignatius's point. But here you see Irenaeus kind of saying, no, like, yes, like these things matter. We have to get this right. Okay. Uh, now seven the, on the next column here, paragraph seven is interesting because it's just simply a, a spiritual reflection, and it's it's basically saying that Jesus is the bridge between God and man. That Jesus is true God and true man, and that um, you know we're created in the image and likeness of God as human beings. We know that from Genesis, and God has given us much guidance. He's spoken to Moses and Abraham and all the prophets, right? There's been many verbal communications. But what Irenaeus says here is the fact that God became man is for our benefit because as human beings, we don't just learn from hearing. We see, we taste, we touch. We're, we're very physical in the way that we learn. And so the fact that God, whose image we're created in, became man, that Jesus in many ways is showing us who we really are. That when we look at Jesus, it's almost who we should look like when we look in a mirror. Um, God has been generous to us in giving us um, his son because um, he reveals to us who we really are. So it's, it's, a, it's a neat little reflection. Probably the most famous quote from Irenaeus is here, two thirds of the way down. For the glory of God is a living man, and the life of man consists in beholding God. Sometimes that's translated, um, the glory The glory of God is man fully alive. That when we are most striving for holiness, that's when we're most who we are, and that's when we most give glory to God. That it gives God glory when we're attuned to who we're meant to be, and that Jesus reveals to us who we're called to be. And so it's, it's a neat thing because, for example, when you hear Jesus teaching in the Gospels, you know, he tells us what we should be doing, right? Um, do this, don't do that. You know, here's a story, here's an example. But it's not just him saying, like, this is what you're supposed to be doing. It's simultaneously Jesus saying, this is who I am. I'm coaching you in how to be like me. Um, and so when we hear stories like the Good Samaritan, it's not just a lesson about how we're supposed to respond to those in need, although that's part of it. But what the first step, though, is it's Jesus revealing to us who he is, right? That Jesus is the Good Samaritan who reaches out to us and that we're called to do the same for others. So it, it's it's just a different way of looking at the Gospels that um, that we learn about ourselves by looking at Jesus. OK, so that's paragraph seven. Paragraph four here is very important for um, our spirituality around Mary. Uh, what Ignatius does here is he takes, or Irenaeus does here, is he takes um, that line from scripture from St. Paul, where he makes reference to Jesus being the new Adam. That just as through Adam, death came into the world, so through Jesus does life come into the world. What Irenaeus does is he expands that to Eve and to Mary. That just as Adam's partner in crime was Eve, Christ's partner in bringing life to the world is Mary. And so you have this pretty famous passage where um, Irenaeus just points this out, that Eve was disobedient, for she did not obey when she was a virgin. But Mary, on the other hand, flipping page six, So also did Mary, um, 
being a virgin, yet by being obedient, became the cause of salvation, both to herself and to the whole human race. Um, so it's this reflection on there at the, that last line in the paragraph. And thus also it was that the knot of Eve's disobedience was loosened by the obedience of Mary. For what the virgin Eve had bound fast through unbelief, this did the virgin Mary set free through faith. So this is the core of our spirituality regarding Mary as Catholics, that um, just as Eve played a direct role in the fall of Adam, where death came into the world through her, so in the same way, through Mary's cooperation with the new Adam, with Christ, that life came into the world, salvation came to the world. And so when we talk about us journeying toward heaven, Mary plays an indispensable role in our journey toward heaven because it is through her partnership with God that life came into the world. So it's kind of a neat um, comparison there. Okay. Two paragraphs to go here. Number one there on page six, that's um, basically the Nicene Creed, so it's going to sound really familiar. I just included it in there so you can see how consistent it all is at this point. And then uh, paragraph two is him making a point, Irenaeus is making a point that we've already seen quite a bit, but he's saying that the church, even though it's spread throughout the world, um, it speaks many languages, it has one soul and one mouth, that it speaks the truth with perfect harmony. Um, so the churches which have been planted in Germany do not believe or hand down anything different than those in Spain or in Gaul or in the East or in Egypt or Libya, that there's one church throughout the world and one teaching, and he's already told us how we find that, that all these churches in Germany and Gaul and Egypt and Spain and Libya, that they all have to be in union with the church in Rome. Because the Son, that creature of God, is one and the same throughout the whole world, so also is the preaching of truth shines everywhere and enlightens all men that are willing to come to the knowledge of the truth. Okay, And the reason for all this is because it all comes from Jesus. That this was Clement's great point, right? That God the Father sent his Son, who then sent the apostles, who then sent bishops after them, so forth through the ages. But to go backwards, it's all coming from the same source. It's all coming from God. That the God who created the world is a God who's revealed himself to us through his son Jesus and then as time continues through his church. And so Irenaeus is just giving us some pretty clear guidance here on where we should look for that. All right. So that ends up that wraps up the series. Like I said, um, at this point in history, um, the writings that you're going to start to encounter are just very familiar to us, um, whether it's Clement or whether it's Cyprian or Tertullian um, and everyone who comes after them. Um, Hippolytus, all of them, and then certainly once you get into the age of Augustine and um, John Chrysostom and all of them, those giants of the faith, um, it's going to all sound very, very familiar to you. Okay, if you want to do further reading on the front page of this, there's three three works here. One is in the style what we did, so Rod Bennett, um, the early church in her own words, is kind of presenting the stories of, of the early church just by quoting from their writings. So um, the first volume is more or less what we just did. The second volume carries on the next hundred years or so. And then you have two other works here. Jimmy Aiken uh, goes through like a topical presentation. So this is what these early church fathers talked about Mary. This is what they taught about the church in Rome. This is what they taught about the relics, you know, those kind of things. And then Marcelino D'Ambrosio um, is more of a presentation in chronological order. So if that's the easier way for you to study, that would be the another way to do it, where it goes through in time, like starting with one work and then going through time. So if you wanted to either reinforce what we just covered and or to go further, um, those are a few suggestions for you. All right, so take care. God bless you.